All right, so it looks like we're ready to get started. Um, once again, I want to thank you everybody for jumping on. Um, and I want to especially thank our guest speaker, Wendell Cox. Um, he is actually going to be up first and he's going to be presenting. Um, and I want to really talk about what Wendell Cox has experienced. And so I'm putting it up on the screen because I think it um, will give everyone a little bit of a different insight as to um, where we're looking at talking about safety of school buses today. And also, um, we are really grateful that he's jumped on and is going to be sharing some of his expertise with us. And um, Wendell, if you would like to get started, I will let you uh, kick it off. And if you want to talk anything about your background, I do up on the screen. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And I apologize for that telephone. I'm, I'm going to, well, actually, I'm tied to the computer, so I can't walk off and move the telephone out of the room. But anyway, yeah, I'll give you, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm go going to give sort of a perspective that's somewhat outside the industry. I think what we want to do, or at least what I want to do, is to sort of offer some thoughts about um, uh, school buses in the context of overall transportation and that kind of thing. And the fact that uh, my own view is that uh, the whole school or pupil transportation industry is just not even known about in this country, except when we, you know, stop for buses in the neighborhoods and that kind of thing. There's certainly plenty of yellow buses around, but for example, if you go and look at the uh, federal transportation statistics, uh, oftentimes you won't even find anything like school buses listed. Uh, I'm not sure if the numbers are buried there. Uh, which is really quite an amazing thing because one of the things I want to do is try to suggest that um, you represent a really, really large industry. Um, just a little bit on my background, I've been all over the place, three, term, uh, three terms appointed to the LA County Transportation Commission by Mayor Tom Bradley. That commission was eventually folded into the current LAMTA uh, when we were merged with the uh, old Southern California Rapid Transit District, and that happened about eight years after I left the uh, commission. And I've been um, a Speaker Gingrich uh, way back when appointed me to the Amtrak Reform Council, and I've spent uh, nine years in Paris as a, that is two months at a time in Paris as a, as a visiting professor, and have done a, a good bit of transportation demographics uh, work as well as um, I'm co-author of really the largest international housing affordability survey in the world. We cover 400 cities and have caused all sorts of trouble all over the world that I'm very proud of on that subject. But anyway, uh, there's a, a lot of good information, as you know, on the web uh, about the school bus industry, but uh, uh, none of it, a lot of it really doesn't get out. Uh, but you are probably all aware that uh, there's something like 500,000 um, uh, yellow buses running around the country at this point. Uh, the Canadian system is in many ways a copy of our system. Both, both systems go back, I believe, to about the late 20s, early 1930s. Um, other countries generally tend not to have school bus systems or, or anything nearly as well organized as what we have. Uh, but when they do have them, strangely, they're yellow. They aren't. They 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 don't look exactly like ours, but they seem to like the color yellow, and um, there's obviously good reason for that. But the U.S. school bus industry is sort of the world um, uh, the world standard, and I wanted to sort of um, give you some perspective of how large it is. Uh, relative to, say, transit, because we all know about transit. And I know you there, Michelle, have a, uh, a big transit system there up and down the, uh, up and down the boulevard. And I uh, knew people that managed that system and did a bunch of work for them, actually, in the early 2000s. And they've done quite a job uh, in Vegas, but they do quite a job elsewhere around, around the country. Uh, but the interesting thing that uh, I was really rather surprised to find out when I began getting into the data about 15 years ago, and, and by the way, I have done some school bus work, but not an awful lot. Uh, but what we discovered is if you look at uh, the daily ridership on U.S. school buses, uh, and we don't really know exactly what that is, but we do know, we do have some estimates out there of how many uh, school or pupils uh, are, are at least taking the bus. We don't know anything about absentee rates or anything like that. So the numbers of when you use pupils are probably a little high, but some, at this point, the number is somewhere like 25 million, it appears, on a daily basis. And that includes public and private school 
uh, pupils, though the overwhelming majority, of course, are public school pupils. Um, and But the interesting thing, if you want to compare that to transit, is you have to recognize that these kids are writing twice a day. So if we were in transit, and I've spent and done an awful lot of work in transit, in transit, we'd say you're you're carrying 50 million rides a day uh, on the days that school is operating. Now, that's only 180 days, but uh, 50 million rides. Uh, probably will be surprising to you to know that transit carries less than 20 million rides. Um, now, you, you, some figures you may see on transit a, a little higher than that, since what happens in transit is, believe it or not, something like, I, I think the number is something like 40% of people who ride transit tra change uh, routes or modes. So they might, for example, if you're in Vegas, go down uh, the, the strip line and, and get off and take a line on Sahara that goes off in a different direction. Uh, the great advantage about school buses, and, and one of the reasons that I think you guys obviously in the long run um, need to retain your systems and not ever really take the, uh, the temptation to merge with transit, uh, is that you provide door-to-door -door mobility. Uh, not quite door-to-door, -door, but, you know, the school child walks out of the house and walks a, a block or two at most and then is delivered immediately uh, directly to the school. And that is uh, really very important as we become more and more concerned about um, uh, safety uh, and security. But pretty impressive. Something like, uh, you know, almost three times as many daily riders on transit on the days that uh, school buses are operating uh, as transit. Uh, or if you want to look at it in terms of passenger miles, and the reason I like to look at passenger miles, so that you're probably aware, but that is is simply if 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 uh, uh, the average school child is riding five miles to the school, uh, that's five passenger miles, one passenger going five miles. But on a daily basis, um, there are something like 250 million passenger miles, and this is based upon estimates from um, uh, the American School Bus Council that suggest that the average school child uh, goes five miles uh, each way. But if that number is right, that's 250 million a day. Uh, and that is about 1% of all the passenger movement in the United States on the surface. That is, that's not counting uh, things like uh, airplanes, but it does count all the trains and buses and all the cars. So it's an impressive uh, passenger volume. Now the, and by the way, interrupt me if I'm boring you or if, I, uh, if, if anybody needs to, but uh, again, the American School Bus Council uh, also estimates that in the morning, about 17 million cars are not on the road taking kids to school uh, that would be if there were no school bus system. Now, um, obviously, some of those cars, the parents are on their way to work, and the car might still be there, but but it still is adding to congestion. But 17 million cars in this country is one big number in the morning. And I'm, you know, I spent half my life with all this data out of the Census Bureau and so on. I just checked the data this morning. If you take all of the commuting that is done in the United States between 7.30 and 9.00, it amounts to something like less than 50 million cars. Um, it's probably a good deal less because I didn't take out the transit people and I didn't take out the now five or six percent of people that work at home. But the point is, if we're taking 17 million cars off the road with buses, with school buses, transit at the very most is taking a, a, a bit, well, transit isn't taking anything li like that. I mean, this is a big number. It's a third, equal to a third of the total cars that are out there commuting. So, and one of my big battles through the years has been, um, you know, with people that always like to talk about the great amount of traffic congestion that transit reduces. Uh, and it does, if we're talking about uh, what I call the six legacy cities of New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Boston, Washington, and San Francisco. But those cities represent about 65% of the transit ridership in the United States. And um, school buses clearly uh, uh, do do a whole lot more than transit does in terms of, of uh, uh, traffic reduction uh, outside those six cities. People don't realize it, but transit is all about getting downtown. I mean, something like 55% uh, of all the transit ridership in the United States is to, uh, uh, commuting in the United States, is to destinations in those six cities, not metropolitan areas, 
and most of those destinations are downtown. And that's one of the reasons transit is successful there, because it does a good job on concentrated demand. But uh, traffic congestion is very, uh, very important. And uh, school buses uh, do a, a, a very big job with respect to reducing uh, traffic congestion. Um, there's also the issue of safety, and I know that's one of your big uh, subjects you're talking about today. And I hope that you are aware of the fact that among the surface transportation mode, there is none that can hold a candle to transit. Now, sometimes the airlines do better, you know, because, uh, you know, there are a number of years where the airlines don't kill anybody, uh, quite frankly, because they don't have an air crash. And that's really good, because I remember, uh, you know, that terrible uh, day, I think it was on a Friday in 1979, when 271 people were killed at O'Hare Airport when an American plane went down, and, 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 and we have a lot less of that. They're much safer than they used to be. But the data out of, again, this is coming from the uh, American School Bus Council and from NHTSA, uh, is that on average, there are about eight school bus fatalities among occupants. Now, this doesn't count somebody that might be killed in a car uh, in an accident with a school bus and anything like that. But there are about eight school bus fatalities on an annual basis. Now, that's not very many, but as all of you in the industry, uh, I am sure, believe and are aware, uh, one is too many, and that doesn't talk anything about injuries and so on. So we can always do better for safety, and the school bus industry has been incredibly uh, safe, um, and, you know, and, and, and the transit industry has been incredibly safe, too, but the, but the ratios are incredible. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, every day, about 1% of all the passenger miles, that's 1% of all the school bus miles, uh, charter bus miles, intercity bus, uh, other transit, railroad, and cars, about 1% of that is on school buses, yet uh, your rate of fatalities is 1 40th of that. So again, uh, a lot of good things to be said about the record of school buses in terms of safety. Um, but at the same time, uh, we always want to do better, and that's what you're talking about. Beyond that, uh, my sense is that the taxpayers get a really good uh, uh, deal as a result of uh, what we spend on school buses. Um, it's hard to get really good comparative numbers. I can get good transit numbers. I can tell you last year, or the last year we've got data for, which is about 2014, we spent about $65 billion on transit. Now, that includes you know, all the, the building of light rail that we're doing and all the, the, the bus driver salaries and mechanics and all that kind of thing. The school bus expenditure is about 25 billion. Um, and that's plus or minus, minus maybe a couple of billion because it wasn't clear how much of the data out of the, out of DO, out of the Department of Education was, um, what was in capital. That wasn't real clear because they didn't break down the bus capital. And of course, um, something like somewhere over 20%, maybe as much of a third, is contractors. There's plenty of um, public-private partnerships uh, going on in school buses, and you have, uh, you know, large school bus operators. In fact, uh, I guess I need to tell you uh, that I was, um, I helped National, what, was, what are they called? I uh, can't even remember. National Express out of the UK. Uh, I helped them with their acquisition program in the United States when they bought a number of uh, bus companies, including Durham. Uh, I knew the Durham people as well. That was around 2000. Uh, and they bought a bunch of people, a bunch of buses around the bus companies around the country as well as um, in, in Canada. But again, I think the taxpayers are getting a good deal there. Um, and um, uh, so, so that's another thing to be said in the favor of, uh, of, of what uh, you're all doing. So uh, I guess I don't have an awful lot more to say about that. I mean, I'd be very happy to answer any questions uh, or, or uh, and I apologize for the fact that, uh, you know, I gave you a whole string of statistics. The basic point is the school bus industry is a very, very impressive business. And in fact, if I were a leader in the school bus industry, I'd be down there knocking at the door of the Bureau of Transportation Statistics and basically saying, you know, we've been around now for nearly 100 years. Don't you think it's about time we include, we're included in your statistics since we carry more passengers than any mode of transport in the United States except for the car? 
and um, and that's pretty impressive. So anyway, congratulations on on really great performance. Uh, and I, as I say, I'm happy to discuss or answer any questions if I can. So I will ask anyone that would like to ask Wendell a question to please raise your hand, and um, we will unmute you so you can ask ask your question. If we have any hands raised, not seeing any hands right now. All right. So, Wendell, I have a question for you since uh, nobody else is raising their hands. Um, yeah. As far as, as, far as um, statistics and gathering that information, um, school districts. Um, could they use any sort of technology to help get that over to the National Highway Transportation Authority? I'm not sure about that. Well, first of all, the statistics, there, yeah, there are two groups of statistics here. One is obviously the safety stuff, and I don't know about the NHTSA are reporting, and they, uh, they may or may not have some automated approaches. Um, the uh, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, and they're the ones you go to, like if, some, if you're sitting over in China and you want to know what's going on the, in, uh, in the United States with respect to transportation, you go to the BTS site and it'll tell you, you know, all sorts of marvelous things about everything but the school buses. Um, my sense is that uh, they have their own ways of, of running down that kind of statistics. Um, you know, in transit, we have the National Transit Database. They get that automatically. They have reporting systems from the various modes. And it may be that somehow it's never been set up. I mean, I, I really do think it would be a value. Uh, uh, and it, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt you in the long run if there are legislative issues for this information to become uh, reported on, on a, a normal basis. And it might make some sense for, you know, um, NAPT, NSTA, the uh, and, and anybody else to maybe get together and go visit uh, the BTS because uh, I'm, I'm sure they don't mean to snub you on purpose, but they're snubbing you. Uh, you know, you can't get that data. I, you know, you have to put it together by going to all sorts of sources that nobody would think to go to and nobody outside the school bus industry, that is. Okay. Well, um, I thank you, Wendell. I don't see any other hands or questions, so I appreciate okay. your time and come talk to us about your expertise in transportation. And um, we're going to continue on and um, discuss some safety. And um, we have a lot to go over, so um, thank you again. Thank you. I'll, I'll say goodbye to you then. All right. Thank you, Wendell. You bet. Thank you. Bye. So to add to what Wendell did, State, the school buses are the largest fleet in our nation. So 8.7 billion in state funds per year. And as Wendell had stated, there's 500,000 school buses that travel our roads daily. And what that looks like is it's massive compared to all the other transportation modes in the US. So 96,000 transit buses, 35,000 coach buses, 7,400 airplanes, and 1,200 passenger train cars. So when you look at the, the statistics and the numbers, um, school buses are um, really the most important mode of transportation in the US. And one of the things that um, we really wanna look at is how are we as an organization and a company and a or group of expertise as well as superintendents looked at upon the structure of our school buses. So it's not only just drivers, um, we also have driver trainers and the support staff. So you have dispatchers, you have human resources, technicians, record keeping. So maintaining detailed trip records for private sector providers, keeping that record for FMN, FMCA regulations. How are we able to do all of this um, and really keep everybody organized? And one of our customers is PSJA and they are actually located in Texas, and they put this amazing video together um, for our national uh, school bus safety in the US week. And I wanted to share it with you because they really did go out and talk to everyone within this group and showed their pictures, and it's really just a great video. And so I'm gonna share it with you guys, and um, I hope everybody can hear it okay. You can read it. <laughs>
that goes to show you that is a lot of people to get their school buses out every day and on the road and really transporting students safely. And it shows everyone from the maintenance department to the dispatchers to the drivers. It was just a really nice way for them to show everybody's involved in student transportation safety. Um, and another thing is he was talking about was the coordinated transportation. So those companies that are transporting students that are not part of the school district. So there are many of those that are out there. Um, and as he said, Durham is one of the largest. Um, and really what their goals are, are there's a lot of time that the buses are idle. They're not being used. So, and when there's no mass transportation available, maybe it's a rural um, area or even communities where they're senior citizens or people with disabilities, low income wage earners, those that need transportation, um, they do offer that and it's obviously a benefit to them. So they can help the community and they can also um, really coordinate some great transportation for people that need it. And we as Fleet Complete can help um, find ways to help those types of bus industries um, to not only utilize for school transportation, but other um, transportation needs in the communities. Um, and as Wendell did say, the school bus transportation is the safest mode of transportation for students. So it is only 1%, but as he did also mention that that's still too many, right? So when we're talking about school bus safety, there's a lot of things that go into that, right? So we all know that they have giant flashing lights, they have large mirrors, they have high seat backs, and the school bus itself is bright yellow for that reason. They want them to be seen. So one of the things that we really wanted to talk about was what else can we do to make the school buses safer right they've got all this amazing hardware and they're put together so that they are safe but what can we do right because the cost of error on a school bus is something that we don't like to see right so one of the biggest things i would have to say is children being left on a school bus um, whether it be due to driver error or a child sleeping and the driver didn't check the bus um, or even just being distracted. And the distraction of a school bus driver could be something as simple as they have a lot on their mind and they forgot. So how can we as an industry look at this and come up with a way to help bus drivers? We're asking bus drivers to walk from one end of the bus to the other every time they make a trip. And the only reason that that is being asked of them is just to make sure that nothing is being left on the school bus, right? Some are looking for backpacks, but the most important thing that you're looking for is that a child was not left on the school bus. Um, and really, I was a kindergarten teacher for almost five years, and you can tell when a kindergarten's first day of school is they're not sure what to do. And a kindergartner was actually left um, on a school bus on their first day of school this year um, because he didn't know to get off the school bus. Um, and, you know, that is something that we want to help and we want to make sure that does not happen. One incident of error um, can cause some long lasting effects, whether it be to the school district, the community, the child itself, um, or even the whole state having to come up with a new plan to make sure that doesn't happen again. And one of the big, big things that we want everyone to consider is who owns your school buses? Is it a private company or is it the school district? So if it is a private company, do they have a post-trip student check policy? And if they do, what does it look like? As a school district, you wanna make sure that your students are being transported safely, but also what do their policies look like? And how is the driving behavior monitored? So erratic driving behavior, um, is, that, is there any way to detect that? Um, in the news just today was a, happened on Tuesday, was an unfortunate event where a driver was driving erratically and two phone calls got made to the, um, the police. And so the police found the school bus and um, monitored, monitored the driving, said they were speeding, they were um, harsh braking, erratic driving. So they pulled the bus driver over and unfortunately he was under the influence of alcohol. So that type of thing is something that we want to make sure that if there is an incident of driving where it's erratic or speeding, how can you mitigate that ahead of time, right? Is there a way that you could have really monitored that driving behavior? And then do parents in the school district want to know where their students' buses? So um, we do have school districts that are quite a ways away um, from their students' homes where it could be an hour-long trip. They may take trips out of state for sporting events. 
And when the school buses are late, do parents call and ask, hey, where's the school bus at? So then that can lead to calling dispatch and dispatch calling the school bus and saying, um, where's your location, right? And then you have to call the parent back and let them know. So is there a policy in place where that can be done rather quickly? So what is it that Fleet Complete does? So we actually are a global leader in transportation and, and fleet management solutions. But what we've done with our school bus initiative is looking at different places on the bus that we can report. So not only fleet tracking, capturing the engine hours and fuel consumption and data from multiple sensors, but also the front door sensor. Every time the door is open, how long was it open for? So when they're going over a railroad track, how long did they stop at the railroad track, open the door, look both ways, right? That can be captured. And then the door was closed. Stop arm sensors, captures and logs when that stop arm is put out and the lights are engaged. Was that done? Um, and back to our emergency handle, we can capture statuses, pre-trip, post-trip inspections, buzzer alarms, um, driver panic buttons. In today's world, having a silent alarm, is that something that is already built into the bus? Um, is there a way that a driver can alert someone that there's an emergency on the bus without actually having to verbally say something? Um, and then also vehicle inspection reports, um, streamlining that pre and post-trip inspection, making sure it's getting done regularly. And then one of the biggest things that we're really gonna be focusing on is post-trip student check. So assisting the driver and making sure that that post-trip is being done at the end of every single trip. So they pick up the students in the morning and then they drop them off at the school bus, they go back to the bus yard. Did they check that bus um, after they got to the yard from the driver's seat all the way to the back door? And then, what does that look like at the end of the day? Well, they know they've already checked it, so they get in the bus, they go pick the kids up at, at school, and then they take them home, they go back to the bus depot, they need to check it again, because students could still be left on the bus at night after school is over. So some of the other things that we can really look at are breadcrumb trails and trip reports. Did the bus take the correct route? Did the bus go and stop somewhere where it was not supposed to? Um, that's something that's really important today is are we utilizing our buses the correct way as well right so are they being utilized on the best route that they were supposed to take so you can look at see which route your bus is taking and did they stop um maybe at another location that they weren't supposed to and then you can always ask well why did you stop over here when the bus route is this way so basically looking at the direction of the bus travel, but also the speeds of the vehicle during that travel. Is there any harsh braking, hard acceleration? And then along with that, really looking at the time and location stamp of every child check. So the child check um, mate switch for is something that has been implemented in some states as a law. Um, and for next year, that will be California's jumping on um, making that law, and, and the law was written um, really around an incident that happened um, with one particular student who was left on a school bus. And this is one of those things that unfortunately happened and now it is going to be um, something that every industry is going to have to, that supports the school district, is gonna have to look at. So. The alarm itself generates this audible sound when the ignition of the vehicle is turned off. So that requires the bus driver to get up and walk to the rear of the vehicle to silence that alarm. And so that means that they walk to the back of the bus and therefore detecting that there were no children left on the bus or if there were, that they did find them. Um, and there's other states that have started to require this, including Arkansas and Wisconsin. And as school buses are coming off the manufacturer line and they're brand new, many of them already have this installed. So that's how important this solution is. Um, another thing is with Fleet Complete, we do have um, push to talk where you can look at your bus on a map and click on it and push this um, button to talk to the driver immediately. So um, it really is a nice solution where you can actually have not only the bus on the map and seeing where they're at, but you can push to talk to that specific bus and that driver. 
And um, we also have mics for that. Um, there's uh, GPS lockbox mounts for tablets, if that's something that is needed. Um, we also work with some forms manufacturers that make electronic forms where we can even put students' names on a, on a tablet and they can check them off as they get on the bus. So therefore, then once they're done for the day or at the end of their shift, they could send that email uh, via email to the office and letting them know these are all the students I picked up today. And at the end of the day, to make sure all the students that are supposed to be on that bus are on that bus, you can also have a list and check off those students as they get on. It's a very simple way just to make sure that the right students are on the right bus um, and also that those students that got on the bus at the beginning of the day were supposed to be there at school and the office knows that those students are there. And then our fleet dashboard. So we do like to look at reporting um, as far as anything that is needed from a school district. So the school district can set certain policies specific for their drivers. And one of the biggest things I would say is that our solution is very customizable. So you can set speed limit incident counts to, I wanna know if anyone is going 10% over the speed limit or a certain mile per hour over the speed limit. And then I want that to be notified too, and you can make sure that that is sent to the correct person. The other real big factor with our reporting is that it is something that you can make sure is done on a timely manner. You can do it by day, you can do it by week, you can do it by month. And then we also have, um, if they have a rule set within the system and that rule is actually broken, it will send an immediate alert and saying, hey, this bus is speeding right now. So that way dispatchers, as well as any support staff for the school district can immediately act upon it and say, hey, we've got a bus driver that is going 20 miles over the speed limit and it will continue to track that speed. So one of the other big things that I know a lot of school districts have is maintenance. Um, school buses do cost a lot of money to maintain. And to help with that, we do offer um, a maintenance module built into our system. So you could schedule it to be um, a calendar event, so maintenance calendar. So every month we wanna make sure this is done or every week. Um, you can also set it to be annual and also by rolling odometer or fixed odometer. So every 5,000 miles, every 10,000 miles, we wanna make sure this is done. Um, one of the other big things is making sure that this is sent to the right person. So if there is a maintenance team that this needs to be sent to, um, they can get that instead of it going to dispatch and then dispatch having to then forward it on, you can have it sent directly to maintenance department. So then they can look at it and say, okay, we need to get bus 26 in here at the next um, day or the next business day because we have DTC codes or we have uh, a maintenance that we need to get done on that vehicle. So <clears throat> with running a more efficient fleet, what we wanted to look at from the beginning was who did that affect? Well, it affected everybody that supports that school bus. And there's a lot of people that are involved. And what we're looking at doing is standardizing more um, student check processes helping automate the trip reporting, and really maintaining performance records. You could even use it as a, as a grade scale saying this bus driver has had no speeding incidences in 30 days, a reward system. You could use it as performance record maintenance um, for those individual drivers, and also really track the effectiveness of your training. So we're doing bus driver training. Everyone went through it at the beginning of the school year. Maybe we need to have another one because we see that there's a lot of school buses that are having um, incidences of harsh braking and speeding. So it can help really support those drivers as well as the support staff. And of course, technicians, we did talk about that, the centralized database for report and um, really finding out, are we maintaining our buses as good as we possibly can to help control the life of the bus? And then making sure that the dispatchers have visibility into the location and status of all the buses. Um, and increasing that response time during an emergency um, is very important. So if there's an emergency on the bus, the dispatcher 
can then send somebody to that exact location immediately. And then record keeping for simple um, audits or even accurate reporting. And then as Wendell said, the uh, gap in the national transportation uh, database um, that there is known today, um, how can we help that maybe become better? So Fleet Complete is really out here to operate a leaner fleet, right? We want to help school districts have reliable service and uncover more business opportunities, automate your reporting and other special processes and simplify the compliance and then obviously react faster. Knowing exactly where your buses are is very vital because the precious cargo that they're carrying are children. And we want to make sure that all of those children are safe and get from their home to school and school to home. And one of the biggest things that I think a lot of people often forget is that school buses do transport 25 million students a day. And I know that that doesn't sound um, like a whole lot, but that is a lot of children. And um, with that, there are many things that could happen any time of the day. Um, and an emergency could happen. And we want to make sure that there's a way for those particular instances to be mitigated as quickly as possible um, to definitely prevent any future um, incidences as well. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to open it up for questions. So it, whether it be on something Wendell had mentioned and maybe it came up later, I can take it down and get back to you. Um, or if it's something that we just briefly went over on the safety um, aspect of the school bus transportation, I'm gonna ask anybody to raise their hand and we can unmute you. Here's somebody coming up. Do you have a question? Hey, Michelle. Yes. Thanks for the presentation. This is this has been some great great information. Um, I've seen technologies out there where you can actually track the buses, and you can check on either your PC or mobile device the location of those. My daughter is down at Georgia Tech, and she's able to see where the buses are out on campus, so she knows when to get to the stop. It, do you have anything that's like that or have you can you talk about maybe how the public schools are using that yeah so um with atc fleet complete we actually do have an open api so what that means is all the information and location that we're collecting um, is open in our back end so they can pull into another system so the system that you're talking about is usually an application that parents can download and it has a, a feed that comes from our system into their back end and then can locate the bus and then it shows up on the application. So the short answer is yes, that is something that we can do. Um, and Fleet Complete has a store as well as many systems that we're integrating with every day. And so we always ask if there is some specific operation that you need within the school district to bring it to us. And then what we will do is we will work with the uh, school district as well as the app developer to put in our open api systems into that application all right anyone else All right, well, looks like it's got really quiet. So um, one of the things that I do want to make sure that I really touch on is what's coming up in the next year is that the child check mate service is going to be, become very vital to many school districts, um, especially in California as the law is 
has actually already been written. If anybody has any questions about reading the new um, Senate bill, um, it is SB 1072, um, and that is for the state of California. And the bill itself is quite long, but what it basically states is that this needs to be something that is audible. As soon as the engine ignition is shut off, the alarm will go will be very loud. <laughs> it needs to go off for 30 minutes until, or if the bus driver gets up, walks to the back of the bus and hits the button. And that button will then disengage the alarm and will then notify everyone that, hey, this bus was actually checked. Um, and if the bus is not checked, um, then that alarm will continue to go off. And I'm gonna show you guys a really quick picture of that. Oop, here it is. So here's the stop button. So that's all the bus driver has to click. And right here is the loud audible sound that comes from the speaker. And with our integration with them, what it's going to do is put a GPS uh, stamp on that and time as to when it was actually done. So if anyone has any questions on that, um, what we are doing right now is we are working with Child Checkmate. They're updating their systems to meet with the compliance um, of the California Highway Patrol. And the California Highway Patrol is the one that will be doing the inspections for the Child Checkmate, not only making sure that there's an audible alarm, but also a policy in place um, that will be on the bus. And the policy will be um, written so that the California Highway Patrol could then make sure that they are in compliance with the new law that was written. So that's one of the biggest things that I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that we are here to help. Um, and if there is anyone that does have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to your AT&T account manager and they know how to get a hold of us. Or you can feel free to reach out to me directly and I can always get the right people engaged. And um, my email is michelle.hardy at fleetcomplete.com. And if anyone else has any other questions, um, I will leave the bridge open for approximately five minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to give some time back to everyone. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope everybody has a good day.